Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Recently, Tamara Litch and Pat King both had bail hearings with respect to allegations made about their participation in the convoy. Now, as these bail hearings were going on, several people were live tweeting about it, including some lawyers, and these tweets were typically not very favorable to Litch or King. In fact, they were quite mocking or insulting. Now, I want to say there's nothing wrong with that, because the tweets I saw, at the time they were made, there wasn't a publication ban in effect. And people have freedom of expression. They're allowed to insult Lich and King. You know, you don't have to like them, and you can voice that. That is part of the freedoms that we enjoy here in Canada. So I'm not faulting the people who are doing this live tweeting. But the thing I was wondering about is that both Lich and King had the power to shut this down, and shut it down before it happened. And I'm not sure why they didn't do this. Um, this may, normally I would think that in a high profile case like this, you'd want to do that, but they may have wanted publication because they were hoping for favorable, uh, favorable press coverage and so forth. So I wanna talk a bit about how they could have shut this down. And that's with a section of the criminal code, section 517. So I'm gonna cover that here and I'm going to do so by actually looking, this is from a court case. This is actually the warning that they stamp on the court cases when there's a publication ban in effect. So we'll have a look at that and it also quotes the law and I'll talk about what the law does and why it's there. So this is again, section 517 of the Criminal Code of Canada. It respects bail he or publication bans in bail hearings. So let's have a look here. Warning, so big letters so that you can tell that this is something you should take seriously. The court hearing this matter directs that the following notice be attached to the file. And when they say that, when you order transcripts of something, you get this notice. Uh, when the case is published, they'll often have this notice on it. Uh, that's just to indicate to people, you got to take this seriously, and it'll explain why. So a non-publication and non-broadcast order in this proceeding has been issued under subsection 517 sub 1 of the Criminal Code. This subsection and subsection 517 sub 2 of the Criminal Code, which is concerned with the consequence of failure to comply with an order made under subsection 1, read as follows. So this is a basically saying not only are you going to have a copy of what the law says, but also we're going to tell you what the punishment is, just so that you know to take this seriously. So section 517 of the Code, and I'll read it out, but I'll interject just to explain things as we go, because otherwise it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. So order directing matters not to be published for specified period. This is not forever. This is for a time limited period. And it's not like a fixed term. It's actually determined by the course of the proceedings. And I'll explain that uh, a little later on. So if the prosecutor or the accused intends to show cause under section 515, what this means is if you're having a bail hearing, and the reason why they say if the prosecutor or the accused is because usually sort of as the default, the prosecutor has to show cause as to why you should be detained. So the burden of saying that you would be kept in jail is on the prosecution. They have to establish that you should be kept in jail and the presumption would be that you get released. Sometimes, however, we have what are called reverse onus bail proceedings. And what those mean is that the burden is actually on the accused instead of the prosecution. So the accused then has to show why they should be released instead of detained. So that's why they're saying if either side is going to run a bail hearing here. So he or she shall so state to the justice, which basically means if you're going to have a bail hearing, you have to tell the justice that that's what you're doing. Makes sense. And the justice may. So that's a discretionary power. The justice may impose one of these and shall on application by the accused. So you see how there's two sort of different criteria here. The justice has a discretionary power to impose this, and that's either on their own motion or because the prosecution has asked for it. They may, but not must. However, if the accused asks for a publication ban under Section 517, that discretion goes away. It becomes mandatory. The justice at that point has to impose it, and there is no question about that. So what that tells us is that Tamara Lich and uh, Pat King both had the option to require a publication ban of this sort, and they didn't do it, and I'm not sure why, as I said. So, before or at any time during the course of the proceedings under that section, 
So this can happen before the proceedings or midway through. You can say, you know what? I think now we need a publication ban. The danger of doing this uh, midway through is that any these aren't retroactive. Anything that was published beforehand is already published. So Tamara Lich, I understand, got a publication ban under 517, but it was at the end of the hearing, towards the end. And so there was already a whole bunch of stuff that had already been published. Cat was kind of, you know, or already out of the bag in that circumstance. So usually you want to do this at the start of the hearing or before the hearing rather than down the road. All right. So make an order that directing that the evidence taken, the information given, or the representations made and the reasons, if any, given or to be given by the justice shall not be published in any document or broadcast or transmitted in any way before such time as... So it's important to note here that this doesn't cover everything. It covers first any evidence that was called in a hearing. So any witnesses that you might have had or documents that might be tendered, but also information given or representations made. Now, what is a representation? Well, in a bail hearing, the standard of the kind of evidence and information that the justice can receive is uh, lower than it would be at a trial. So if if defense counsel are running a bail hearing, they might say, listen, I spoke to the accused jo you know, boss and the boss confirms that he has a job. That job is waiting for him upon release. And so, you know, if released, this person is going to be working. This is a representation because it's not evidence. You, the lawyer isn't in a position to call evidence uh, or at least not to testify and provide evidence. There, there's rules against that. Uh, but, you know, you don't have the employer there. If you wanted to call this as evidence, you'd bring the employer in to be sworn and to testify personally that that job was waiting for them. Now, these kinds of representations are allowed in a bail hearing. This is permitted. And you might wonder, well, why doesn't the lawyer just say whatever it takes to get the accused released? Well, this is actually a really big deal. As a lawyer, you're the entirety of your career essentially rests on your reputation. Uh, your reputation is everything, and there are rules against making false representations. If you are representing something to the court, you should be confident in it. So uh, no lawyer, at least, you know, they shouldn't. I don't think any lawyer would go up and knowingly make a false representation because you could face sanction for that, potentially including disbarment. Um, when a lawyer says something, they're supposed to be confident in it, they're supposed to stand behind it, and they can be punished if that's not the case. So that's why that's allowed in this narrow circumstance. So those representations and evidence are not uh, to be published, and the reasons for the decision made by the justice. So when the justice says either I'm granting bail or I'm denying bail, they'll explain why. Judicial decisions come with explanations and reasons for why they made the decision. Uh, so they'll say, listen, I, you know, I am denying bail in this case because I think uh, this person can't be released on the following grounds. And this is why I think that they can't be released on those grounds. That is also covered by the publication ban. But some things that notably are not covered, um, the identity of the accused. So they can publish, you know, that Tamara Litch had a bail hearing. That's perfectly fine. Um, and they can publish as well the charges. That's not covered. So they can say, you know, was charged with and list the charges. So this is a narrow set of restrictions here. And it, as I said before, it lasts for only a specified time. Let's have a look at that. So before such time as first, if a preliminary inquiry is held, the accused in respect of whom the proceedings are held is discharged. Now note, a preliminary inquiry is a sort of trial before the trial, and it's just to determine if there's enough evidence for something to go to a full trial. The standard for that is really low. It basically has to be that there is some evidence on all of the point or all of the essential elements of the offense. So it's a really low standard. It doesn't mean that the justice hearing the preliminary inquiry uh, or the judge hearing the preliminary inquiry rather thinks that it's going to, uh, that there's going to be a conviction. They might say, I don't think there's going to be a conviction, but there's still some evidence so it can go on. At the end of a preliminary inquiry, there's a couple of different results that you can get. 
One is that the, the judge says, no, there's not enough evidence. Uh, these charges cannot proceed any further. And so the accused is discharged. Off you go. These charges don't exist anymore. In that case, the publication ban ends. However, the other option is that they can commit the accused to stand trial on some of the charges, some, all. Um, and in that case, the publication ban still continues in effect on to the next step which is if the accused in respect of whom the proceedings are held is tried or ordered to stand trial, the trial is ended. And that is one way or the other, conviction or acquittal, either way. So what this means is essentially that the publication ban lasts until as long as the charges do. And once the trial is result, like once the charges are dealt with, either by the accused being convicted or acquitted or charges being withdrawn or something along those lines, um, that's when the publication ban ends. So failure to comply. Everyone who fails without lawful excuse, the proof of which lies on him, so this is says you have the burden of establishing the lawful excuse, to comply with an order made under subsection 1 is guilty of an offense punishable on summary conviction. Summary conviction offenses in Canada are the less serious. There is no indictable option here. But when we say less serious, that doesn't mean not a big deal because the minimum or the maximum punishment on summary conviction is $5,000 in fines as well as two years less a day in jail. That used to be six months, but that was increased to two years less a day. You might be wondering why two years less a day and not just straight two years. It's actually that there's a whole bunch of other legal provisions that essentially trigger at the two year or two year plus a day mark. And so because of that, they they tailored it to that two years less a day. Um, I can't really go into in this video all of the things why that matters, but um, take my word for it here. Uh, that's why they picked that uh, particular time frame. All right, so you might be wondering, why do they do this? Because um, lots of people who are accused of offenses have a reason to want a publication ban, uh, especially because, you know, being accused of an offense is often embarrassing. It's often something, you know, you don't want your neighbors to know that you were charged with, especially um, serious or notorious kinds of offenses. Um, so why don't we just put a publication ban on everybody? Well, we have open courts principles where normally we say that, you know, the press has the right to report on things. However, this is really a, a provision to protect the integrity of the system, especially if there might be a jury trial, because you might want to ensure that jurors haven't seen in the news a whole bunch of details about the allegations that otherwise they might not have seen. There's some other reasons why the accused might want this and why the court might protect you know, want to protect this, um, including things like, let's say you are telling the court you've got a job and you're telling the court, listen, I'm going to go work at Bob's Builders after this. Um, he's confirmed that I've got the job, but let's say the charge you're facing is something really notorious, something that really makes people angry. Well, now, because it's being reported in the newspapers that that's where you're going to be, you know, working because nobody got a publication ban. Well, now people start calling your boss and saying, hey, we hear you're employing, you know, Joe Blow and he's charged with all these bad things. And pretty soon your boss is saying, I'm not going to I'm not going to hire you. You're done. You know that you've become too, too hot. Um, the other thing you might have is you might tell the court, listen, my plan on release is that I'm going to live with my sweet old grandma. And grandma is, she's not going to put up with any BS. She's going to watch over me. She's going to make sure I follow the conditions. But again, you might be in a, you might be accused of something really unpopular. Or you might be somebody like Ian Thompson, who was charged with firearms offenses after he defended himself from people who tried to firebomb his house. Well, you know, if you, if that's your situation and you just finished defending yourself from people who tried to firebomb you, well, then you might not want the world to know that you're going to be living with your grandma because you don't want grandma to get firebombed next. So these are, you know, sort of protections to allow the bail hearing to happen and to allow in some ways uh, the accused to speak freely, at least through their counsel, 
to about what they're going to be doing and what provisions they're going to take without having to worry that all of the world might array themselves against the accused to try to uh, try to interfere with those things or, you know, threaten them. But mainly, I think that this is a provision to try to protect jury trials. You don't necessarily want the jury to hear all of the lurid details that the Crown might think are what happened. But later at trial, the Crown turns out that they can't prove them. And so, but the jury's already been, you know, the jury pool has already been tainted by hearing this stuff. So that, I think, is the main uh, reason for this. As I mentioned before, I don't know why Lich and King didn't ask for this. It seems to me that this might have been at the top of the list, but I'm not counsel for either of these people. I'm not privy to those discussions. There's reasons why they might have tactically said, we want this to be reported. We think that it's important to do so, especially when we're talking about people who are, you know, engaging in what, in a political protest, you know, and the legalities of the political protest are another question here, but, you know, certainly that was their goal is to, uh, you know, to make, make some noise, uh, both literally and figuratively, if, uh, if you pardon that sort of turn of phrase here, but they were trying to attract attention to their cause. Um, they might think that by portraying this, that they'll be seen as martyrs. I don't know what's, you know, what's being thought of there. But certainly this is a consideration if you are charged with an offense and, you know, in need of a bail hearing. Um, typically, I would say that if you're charged with anything that might be remotely newsworthy, you know, either because the charges are serious or because of, you know, that sort of thing, these provisions are really how you can slow down media interest in it, especially because... Uh, the difference between the news reporting on your story versus not might hinge on how much detail they can pack into it. If all they can say is, you have been charged, that's probably not going to make a very interesting story. So if you're charged with an offense, talk to your lawyer and hopefully they'll run through whether or not this is something you want to want to ask for. Anyway, some people had asked about this because I had mentioned on Twitter and I'd said, why isn't there a 517 publication ban on this? So some people were quite properly saying, well, what are you talking about, Runkle? What is a 517 publication ban? Hence why I'm talking about it. Anyway, thank you for watching. Um, there's a case out of Ontario that a lot of people have asked me to comment on. It's a family law decision, so it's a bit out of my wheelhouse, but I am going to do some commentary on it uh, just to discuss um, some other corollary issues. I also want to do a video in the near future talking about uh, reasonable apprehension of bias because a lot of people have been talking about reasonable apprehension of bias uh, with respect to, again, the, the bail hearings in the, this case. So I'll, I'll, I've got a video on that uh, that I'm going to be working on and talking about it and talking about what the law is on reasonable apprehension of bias. So stay tuned. Anyway, thank you for watching. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Jonathan Wheeler, Canada's National Firearms Association, Kyle Martin, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sites and Arms Limited, and Mark Olivier Demour. And at the $20 level, Peter Hilger, Mark Whittington, Jane Babe and Luxor, Hay Wire, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Bruno R., Andrew Elsich, and Aaron Delso. Thank you as well to the $10 supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge and let me know in the comments section below what you think or if there's anything you want to see me cover. As I said, I've got a few things people have been asking me about and I'm going to be covering those in some videos upcoming. But um, there's lots of stuff going on in the world and just sort of if there's something that uh, people are really clamoring to, to know about, I will try to cover that uh, sort of as soon as we can. Anyway, thank you for watching. Hope this has armed you with knowledge.